So last Thursday, <coughs> technology failed me, and apparently the camcorder started recording and quit recording at just odd times, and so there's just a jumble of the lecture from Thursday when I put it up on YouTube and watched it. I didn't post it into the D2L site with the link because it, was, it just made no sense. There were like large pictures of people just walking around and talking when I turned it off, and no pictures of me or the people that I asked questions of. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of go over what we did last Thursday, so that will be on the video, so I'll do last Thursday's lecture in, in a very abbreviated form, so that will be on the video for you all to study. And then we'll also continue on with that discussion in terms of the history of marketing. And then we'll talk about your article reviews and how to write your article reviews to argue it from a logical perspective that will allow you to maximize the grade points that you're going to want to get on both the article review and the group project in terms of what I'm looking for on those in terms of the format and things like that. So you had two critical thinking challenges that I gave you last Thursday. The first of which was to figure out how to calculate your grade and maximize your utility in this course so that you're not asking me at the last week what's my grade in this class because there's 131 of you in this class, there's one of me, and if you haven't figured it out by that point, it's hard for me to get through answering everybody's email and also credit all of the other exams and papers that I had that last week. And so I do this critical thinking so that you can figure out how it is that you want to get the value from this course that you want in terms of maximizing your points and also so that you can figure the grade uh, without asking me at the end of the semester. So there was that critical thinking challenge and I would like for your group leaders to give me that one first and then the second one was I gave you an example of an article review that I wrote. Actually it was an excerpt of a book review that I wrote. And I said, there's something missing from this, that you need to figure out what was missing, and then add that part to it. You needed to write in as though you were the author of that review, and complete the review with, by adding that missing part. So what we're going to do is I will ask for the first critical thinking challenge on figuring or calculating your grades. So if you have your group leaders, will give me that. I will take that and then grade it and hand it back by Thursday. I suspect that there will be a number of groups every semester that I do this that have to recalculate the grade because they get it wrong and I'll give you partial credit for recalculating it if you got it wrong. And then on Thursday you'll turn in that second part. So I had you start on that last week and then today we're going to talk about what it is that you're going to do in terms of making logical arguments and that will help you with your review. And it might also provide you some insights. I had you start working on it to think critically about this, what's missing, but it might provide insights into what you need for that second critical thinking challenge that I gave you on Thursday, which is how you're going to complete that thing so that it, it's a complete review. Hopefully the camera stays on. So what we did on Thursday, we started talking about the science and the domain of marketing. And I asked you if history was important to an understanding of marketing, given the fact that I can now control my camera with my phone, and that's something that we wouldn't have even dreamt of 20 years ago. There's more computing power in your hands than most supercomputers uh, had in the 1960s, and what qualified as a supercomputer in the 1960s. So is a history of marketing important? And one of you said that yes, it was. It was important so that we didn't repeat mistakes of the past, because we are constantly evolving and growing. Understanding where we came from is important. And then the second question I asked you was, is marketing an art or a science? And we agreed that it was both. It's both an art and a science. And of course, the third question I asked, which was, is everything on a college campus either an art or a science? And I told you that there is maybe a third category, and that's uh, completely rational, logical argumentation or pure logic may be a third thing. It's not, not necessarily a science um, and not, not necessarily an art. So there may be this third category. Mathematicians would argue with me about that, but they would be wrong. So we talked about the definition of marketing, and I gave you the original definition from 1935. And for the sake of uh, getting the recording, I'm going to give that to you now. If you weren't here, you needed to get that, and you can get 
get it off of today's lecture, but I, I gave it fairly slowly. Today I'm just going to read it pretty quickly, and then we'll talk about the current definition, the 1935 definition, which is the original definition of marketing from the American Marketing Teachers Association, the predecessor of the AMA, is that marketing is the performance of business activities that direct the flow of goods and services from producer to consumer. So marketing is the performance of business activities that direct the flow of goods and services from producer to consumer. And what we talked about on Thursday was the fact that this is a really too limited definition. It focuses merely on business activities and it doesn't recognize that marketing is something that we all do, that we all engage in. That organizations besides businesses engage in marketing. Last Tuesday, when this class started, an historic event happened that evening after this class. What was that historic event? It was the final State of the Union for who? For Barack Obama. This is an historic event. And it was a marketing speech. He was trying to market to the country and saying, this is what you should do. You should follow my vision uh, into the future and trying to lay out the framework for his legacy and what, what he thinks we need to do in terms of going forward. And so it was really a marketing speech. It was largely for the benefit of the American people. So the current definition of marketing, which is in your textbook on page five, is that marketing is an activity for creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging offerings that benefit its customers, the organization, and stakeholders in society at large. And the AMA is asking for people to write articles and maybe contribute to uh, an evolving definition of marketing. And I think that what we need to add to that definition of marketing is that marketing is a pervasive social activity. You do it constantly. You can't escape it. And I told you that Aristotle said, man is by nature a social creature. So are the geese and so are bees. But the thing that's allowed us to survive as a species may be our ability to market and to get people to accept our ideas, come together and build something for a better future. And that involves marketing. So it is this pervasive activity that we constantly engage in. And understanding how we got to the point we are today, I think, is important. And so what we talk about is we talk about some philosophies of marketing. And they correspond roughly to some eras in marketing. Does anyone, I know I have one student in here that's also in my sales class. So you heard this. Is anybody else in my sales class? This is weird. OK, so you, I'm sorry. You're going to hear this again for the second time today about the history and philosophy of marketing. So for most of human history, what we have is a philosophy that we call the production philosophy of marketing, or the production era. So the production era begins with the earliest societies. And I told you on Thursday that we find echoes of this philosophy in the emergence of society and we see it in the Genesis story in the Bible of Adam and Eve. And when they eat from the aptly named tree, fruit of the tree of knowledge, we become different and distinct from the cosmos. And we recognize ourselves as not being part of the cosmos, but being part of a historic epoch. And at that point in time, society to begin to form and we begin to engage in marketing. Now, for most of that history of our species, marketing has been based on the theory that could be summed up by a line from a movie called The Field of Dreams. And the takeaway line from the movie in The Field of Dreams is, if you build it, they will come. Right? If you build something, though, people will buy it. For most of human history, if I had something of value, I could sell it, I could barter it, I could trade it for something else of value, and people were willing to accept that. So if you build it, they will come. And the classic example, of course, is Henry Ford's Model T. You could get a Model T in any color you wanted so long as the color was black. Why would we put up with a black car? Well, it was better than the alternative. It was manufactured for a <coughs> relatively homogenous population. Everybody has transportation needs. 
And there wasn't a lot of alternatives to the Model T except the horse. Automobiles were largely a novelty item that were owned by the wealthy people in this country. And they were sort of, you know, this kind of uh, weird fascination. And most people got around by riding their horse or in their buckboard wagon or whatever. And along comes Henry Ford and he revolutionizes the auto industry by making an automobile that was affordable for most people. And so it was better than the horse and we were willing to accept that. And we were largely a homogenous society in that there was two alternatives. There was horse or Model T for most people. And that worked for most, of, uh, for most people at that point in time. But what happens is other people start to recognize that there's this huge need that could be met. And so they start to enter the market and they start having competition. And when we get uh, away from the production philosophy and we start interested in uh, a sales philosophy, the sales era. So what you're going to do is you have more competitors that enter the market now as we have more businesses that are emerging. And there is differentiation between the products. And so the focus in sales is about pitching your product and making sales. Getting awareness, interest, desire, <coughs> and action. And so it's about making a sale and then moving on. And it's from this era that we get maybe a lot of the negative stereotypes that we have about salespeople. A lot of students come to college and they say they want to get a business degree because they recognize the value in that degree and that it's going to provide you with a substantive skill set that you can then take and go out into the marketplace and engage in business and make a living. But a lot of students say, but I don't want to be a salesman. Why do you think that is? Why do you think they say, I don't want to be a salesman? People hate salesmen. Why? They don't like people coming knocking door to door on their They don't want to be bothered with people trying to sell them. There's one of the gurus of sales says, we love to buy, but we hate to be sold. We love to buy. This may be one of the law-like generalizations of marketing. We love stuff. Money cannot buy happiness, but it can delay depression. <laughs> Can't it? When you buy something, the same chemical reactions in the brain that occur when you eat the cookie, smoke the cigarette, take a hit of cocaine, or any of those other kinds of pleasure activities occur. When we buy something, those same chemicals in the brain, when we, when we put people under fMRI technology and watch what happens in their brain when they do things like buy stuff on QVC, that same pleasure part of the brain is activated. We love to buy, but we hate to be sold. Why is that? I think part of it emerges from our fight or flight instinct. When people come up to us and, and accost us, we are naturally sort of skeptical. And we have this instant sort of fight or flight reaction. And we don't, we don't want to feel like we're being taken advantage of. And so we hate to be sold. And this sales philosophy or the sales error may be the result of why we have these feelings. Now, there are still companies that use these older philosophies even today. Apple and Microsoft are examples of companies that have used historically a production philosophy. They're going to build a product, pump it out there, and you're going to buy it. Why? Because you don't have a lot of alternatives. So they can build it and you will come. You, you will buy the iPhone. Now, Steve Jobs being dead has led to Apple being more of a market-based company than it was in the past. Steve Jobs, and I told my sales class this this morning, for those of you who were in there, I'm sorry you have to hear this again. 
said there would never be an iPad Mini because he believed that in order to enjoy the iPad, you had to have a certain screen size in order to get the full effect. And he said there will never be an iPad Mini. The minute Steve went to be with Jesus, we got the iPad Mini because they stopped engaging in this production philosophy. Steve was going to tell us what we wanted, and he did. He really believed that his products were so unique. If you went back and you had the first Apple II computer, they viewed themselves as artists. And so if you looked on the inside, how many of you watched the uh, special on Steve Jobs that was done by CNN? The inside of the Apple II computer, they had the signatures of everybody that worked on it because they viewed it as their work of art, as their contribution to this. And so he really was very solipsistic in his, out in his out outlook. And so he used this production philosophy. Then in the sales era, we get this, this pushy sales mentality, maybe. How many of you have been to Mathis Brothers? How many of you like going to Mathis Brothers? Why don't you like going to Mathis Brothers? They follow you around. They follow you around. It's all about that hard sell. Because they hire more salespeople than they need to make sure that they are, there's a high pressure sales tactic. And it's in this era that we get this high pressure selling that maybe leads to a lot of people saying, well, I want to get a degree in business, but I don't want to go into sales. And really, sales is what generates revenue. And so if you want to make a lot of money, if you want to excel at the firm, selling is one of the areas where you could do that. And a lot of CEOs are now coming more and more from marketing and sales than from other things, because you don't need accounting to run a business necessarily. The more complicated the business is, it makes it easier but you don't really need it. Marketing is the only fully integrated function of the firm, and you have to sell stuff. So it's the sales era, which is making the pitch, getting interest, and then moving on to the next sale, which uh, emerges after the production era. Now, there are still <coughs> companies that rely on the sales era. Where can you see the sales philosophy in action? Well, you see the sales philosophy in action. How many of you remember he's dead now, Billy Mays? I mean, what was Billy's most popular product, probably? OxyClean was probably the one. But Billy had all of these products that he marketed. They were sold. And he would make these pitches. So for example, one of the ones that I remember trying was something called Orange Glow. And he said, you know, if you have wood floors, this is the greatest product. You just spray it on your wood floors, and it will be use. He, he had the sander, and he was showing how you, you took the sander and put it on your wood floors that and scratched them all up. You could pour some orange glow on it and it would solve that problem. And it didn't really work because I had wood floors in my home at the time and so I tried it. It, it was it smelled good and it cleaned fairly well, but it was not like repolyurethane your floors. And so he pitched it on television, he got you to buy it, and they said, well there's money back guarantee, but what's the chances that you're going to send a product like that back? Very little, why? The risk is de minimis. The product costs seven dollars for a bottle of Orange Glow, and to send it back, you're going to have to do what? Thank you. Yeah, mail it into the company and get your money back. Who's really going to do that? You're probably going to do what instead? Yeah, just maybe maybe finish using it, but not buy it again, which is what I did. I used it all up, and then I didn't buy it again because it didn't work as wonderfully as they said it would. Now, OxyClean actually works fairly well. It doesn't work as well as Billy said. You know, Billy would show kids going out and running in, in dirt and grass and getting all these stains and then just spraying a little OxyClean on it and the stains just magically disappear. It didn't work that well, but it actually does work pretty well and it does work pretty well at getting things like blood and grass out of your clothes. It takes a little bit more than a little bit of the solution. You've got to kind of use the washer. You may have to do it twice, but it works fairly well. That's an example of the sales philosophy. You also see this philosophy at one of my favorite events every year. It's called the State Fair. The Great State Fair of Oklahoma. I love the fair. And it is a little slice of Americana that all of you should go and enjoy. Every year I get a season pass to the fair and I walk around the fair because it's an example of selling. These people, are, they've got these little headphones on and they're pitching products and it's about getting interest in their product and selling you the product and moving on. And they don't really care about building a relationship with you because in two weeks, where are they going to be? At the next fair. They're going to, be moved, they're going to move on to the next thing. So it's about if you go through all of the buildings, 
It's about making these sales pitches and getting interest, awareness, desire, and then a marketing action, which is selling you the product. So they use the sales arrow there. They're pitching it, and they don't, they don't intend to you know, build a long-term relationship with you because most of the products are not something that uh, you're going to care much about, you know, maybe for more than about five minutes after you buy them. There are some interesting ones that I, I think are not well suited to the pair that they have started selling there that I'm fascinated by. They've started selling these massage chairs at the fair. And the cheapest model of the massage chair is $3,000. And I'm thinking that for $3,000, this is not, this is something that you want to be able to take it back to the store and say, it's not working. You want probably a warranty and a guarantee that there's something behind it that you're going to be able to enforce when the massage chair breaks down. But a lot of the products are not $3,000 chairs. They're things like the sham wow or pots that they say are you know going to last a lifetime and if they don't what are you going to do well are you going to wait till the next year when they come back and try and get your money back probably not so after the sales arrow what we get is we get the marketing arrow and it's a recognition that what we can do is we can study So the production era is for most of human history until about the 1920s. Until the 1920s. In the 1920s, we start to see the sales era. And the sales era goes from about the 1920s until about the 1950s or 60s, and we get the marketing era, where we recognize that we can actually study people from a scientific perspective and figure out what it is that they want, what it is that they need. Doing things like focus groups, survey research, asking customers if they enjoyed their experience, making the customer a subject of scientific inquiry that we get with the marketing philosophy. So it's now figuring out what it is that people want in a scientific way and then giving them that. We've now moved beyond the marketing era into what we call the era of relationship marketing or value co-creation. So this goes from about the 1960s or 50s to about the 1980s, 1990s. And so here we get the 1980s or 90s until present value co-creation. So now it's not just about studying our customer. It's about making them a part of the team. <coughs> realizing and recognizing that customers have a lifetime value. It's easier to keep a customer than it is to go find a new customer. It's expensive to go find new customers. If you can keep your customers happy, that's far less pr problematic than trying to find new customers out there. So how do you engage in value co-creation? And in this era, what we see with value co-creation is also mass customization of products. A recognition that it's no longer just a homogenous populace out there. That people have lots of different needs and so how do we engage them and mass customize to them. Dell is a prime example of mass customization. When Dell got started, you wanted to buy a Dell, you did what? You called Dell up or you went online and you ordered the Dell, and they mass customized it based on your needs, what kinds of things you wanted to run on that computer, and then they shipped it out to you. So that you got the processor that you wanted, you got the storage that you wanted, things like that. Now there has been some, you know, reintroduction or less mass customization by Dell is they recognize that some people actually want to go and not wait for the product. They want to be able to go to the store and buy it today and use it today. So they'll sell it to Best Buy. But they engage still in mass customization. You can order a Dell and you can get what you want in it. M&Ms, forever and ever and ever, was this little chocolate candy that had five colors sold in a cellophane package. You can now get M&Ms in all kinds of colors. You can get, and you can go to my M&Ms and you can customize what you want. This is 
engaging the customer and creating value for them. So let's take a look here. So you can go to myMMs.com and you can now get M&Ms that are in all kinds of different colors. You can get them in pastel, you can get them with your image, your creepy picture for your wedding <laughs> on there. You can get them not just in a cellophane package, but you can get them in all kinds of different containers. So you can buy these decorative packages, you can get little tins, you can get uh, an M&M bubble gum machine. So this is mass customization that you can engage in and value co-creation. So it's about this recognition that we can no longer just assume that people are all the same. Even the most generic of products now are differentiated. So, in the past, what's one of the staples for breakfast that most people have? What? Frosted flakes? Okay. How about eggs? Right? Are eggs just eggs anymore? No, you now have all kinds of eggs. You have what? You have egg beaters, you have reduced cholesterol eggs, you have uh, cage-free eggs, you've got Eglin's Best eggs that are supposed to be lower in cholesterol. So even eggs have got this customization for people. Milk, what kinds of milk are there? There's soy milk, there's almond milk, there's reduced fat milk, 1%, 2%, skim milk, chocolate milk, whole milk. All of these things, they've now got lactose-free milk for people who have uh, lactose intolerance. And most, by the way, most adults are slightly lactose, uh, slightly lactose intolerant. Why is that? We are the only creature, by the way, that drinks milk after the weaning. Yes. And that's why. We're really, it's not really, we're not really designed for it. So we're slightly lactose intolerant. We're the only creature and that drinks another creature's milk. Another creature's milk, that's right. And so most people are slightly lactose intolerant, so they now have lactose-free milk. So even the most generic of products, the most generic staple or commodity is now differentiated. And it's this, this era of value co-creation that we now live in, where we have to really engage our customer and understand them. And it's what I try to do in this class. So there's lots of ways, this exercise that I gave you with regard to your grades, there's lots of ways you can get an A in this class. If you are not really great at tests, you can do what? You can do really well on the article review and the group project and your critical thinking challenges and maybe make up for that. For those of you who really like tests, you can take tests and maybe not participate as much. You can come to class or not. It's on, you know, it's being recorded. If you don't come to class, you're not going to get the points and eventually I'll start taking off uh, from your grade. But, you know, it's about letting you experience and engage in this class in the way that is most beneficial to you so that you can get the information and the knowledge that you need in the best way. That's why I do it in a number of different ways. So we engage in this idea of value co-creation. And so we see uh, evidence of these other philosophies being uh, still used by some companies. But overall, what we're seeing is more and more people want to feel unique and different. And so they want unique products. Your dress, your clothing, all of this is an expression of who you are. And so it's no longer just about making 
genes in small, medium, and large, and being able to ship those out there. <coughs> Wrangler is perhaps one of the examples of a company that, that clung to sort of a basic cut of gene forever, and now if you go to, to Shepler's or anything like that, what is Wrangler doing as a result of response to the other gene manufacturers that were putting out genes that had all kinds of what? All kinds of bling on them, and you can now get Wranglers. Wranglers forever and ever were just this basic blue gene, and now even Wranglers come with the 20X and lots of stitching and all kinds of other things that you can get on your Wrangler genes. So it's no longer just about producing sort of a small, medium, and large and putting it out there. We've got to engage in this idea of value appropriation. Any questions about the philosophies of marketing? Okay. So what we need to do is we need to talk about, and I put on your syllabus, this is not in the textbook. It's amazing what I know that's not in the textbook. If you could just get it all from the textbook, you could take this course by correspondence or online or something like that. It's amazing what's not in the textbook. And so I'm going to talk to you about argumentation. Because fundamentally, what we're going to do as marketers is we are going to make arguments. We are going to make arguments to our customers as to why they should buy our products, why our product is superior to other people's products. That's an argument. There's an apocryphal story about W.C. Fields. Who knows what the term apocryphal means? Nobody? Okay. It means that we don't know if it's true or not. It's probably not true. But it may be true, but we're not sure. So there's an apocryphal story about W.C. Fields that says that a woman came up to him, and he had been in his cups, which is an old-fashioned way of saying he'd been drinking. And she said, Mr. Fields, you're drunk. And he said, yes, madam, but you're ugly. And in the morning, I will be sober. <laughs> so is that an argument? No, it's not, technically speaking, an argument. It's not an argument. It's funny. It may lead to a fist fight if you say it to the wrong person. It may lead to a shouting match, but it's not an argument. So students often tell me, I just don't like to argue. I'm just not a confrontational person. I don't like it. The world is made up of arguments. We're going to argue why our business, our firm, our product is superior to others. And so understanding arguments is fundamental to marketing. Advertising is fundamentally an argument. It's an argument promoting a product and as to, uh, as to why you should buy a particular brand or product. And so we're going to engage in argumentation in this class through your critical thinking exercises. You're going to make arguments every week. You're going to make an argument about what the students should do in the grade uh, that I gave you. What you need to do to fill in uh, that other critical thinking that I gave you from last Thursday. And so what you're going to do is when you take your article review, when you find an article that you want to review for this class that involves some issue of marketing, and then ultimately in your group projects, which is an expanded sort of article review, you're going to analyze that and make an argument about those things, about the article, whether or not the authors did a good job, for example. And so there's a method that we teach primarily in law school, but I think it's very useful in marketing as well, called the IRAC method, which stands for issue, rule, application, conclusion. So when you read the articles, you should identify all of the issues that are involved in the article. Some articles may have two or three issues. There's always an ethical issue that you can find in the marketing of most things. Is it ethical to market these devices? How many of you have laptop computers? OK, lots of you have laptop computers. Is it ethical to market these devices? Is there some ethical implication to having this laptop computer? Sure there are. What kinds of ethical implications are there? Well, the price 
should we give it, you know, should we set the price so that everybody can afford it? That's an Apple, you both have uh, MacBooks there. Those are expensive. Are they worth the value? As opposed to, for the cost of a MacBook, you could buy how many netbooks? A lot. A lot. Five, maybe, right? So, is that, is that ethical to set the price so high to make it a prestige product? That has ethical implications because what it is, is it's a prestige product. Apple engages in this idea of prestige marketing. It's also these, these devices that we have have created an entire generation of students that I think have ADD because you're so used to having all of this at your fingertips and being entertained constantly and a large part of that is this device and those. Not thinking that you really have to think deeply because, oh, I'll just Google it. How many of you sit around when somebody says, oh, get on Google, I'll ask Google. So there's ethical implications. So think about all of the issues that are involved in these, in these articles that you're going to read. What are the rules? Well, what kind of rules can we find? Well, is it a sales philosophy? Are they using a sales era philosophy in selling like Apple does? There's a rule to that, which is create awareness, interest, desire, and get marketing action. If it's an ethical rule, we'll talk about ethics. What are the application, and then finally reaching a conclusion? So IRAP. So, making these logical arguments within this framework of analyzing issues and articles in marketing is important. How do we go about, within this framework of issue, rule, application, conclusion, making logical arguments? Well, the first thing you need to do is you need to understand the difference in argumentation between valid and invalid and true and false. They're not synonyms for each other. So you want to structure your arguments in your papers in such a way that they are both valid and true. So valid and invalid deal with the structure of an argument and whether or not it, it has a good logical structure to the argument. That's valid or invalid, true or false, deal with whether or not the premises you use in support of your argument have a basis in reality. So you want to structure your arguments in such a way that you argue from premise to premise to premise to conclusion, and that's a logical and valid structure, but it's also got a basis in reality, which is true. So what's an example of this? Here's a validly structured argument that may or may not be true. If it rains, the streets get wet. It rained, therefore the streets got wet. Now that's not going to be true today, if I said that, is it? Is it going to rain today? No. It's logically structured, but if it doesn't rain and I say it, it doesn't have any truth. So make sure that your arguments have both a logical structure, and we'll talk more about how you structure these, and that there's a basis in reality for them. And this is pretty difficult, particularly when you're dealing with products. If you're analyzing products and things like that, and you're arguing that a business, for example, made a good decision in the marketing of a product, well, how are we going to determine whether or not that decision was a good decision? Is it by sales volume? Is it by sustainability? Is it according to uh, you know, some ethical framework that we have? So in structuring it to make sure that it's logically valid, you want to be able to distinguish between the evidence that you give in support of your argument, which is called a premise, and the conclusion. And far too often what I find students doing in these article reviews is reusing their conclusion as a premise. And that's a logical fallacy called begging the question. Just restating your conclusion in a different form and pretending that it's a premise is not logically valid. And I find students doing that all the time. They'll, they'll just restate their conclusion. 
find politicians doing it a lot as well. They just throw something out there and restate their conclusion and use it as an argument. So distinguish between your premise and your conclusion. The evidence that you give in support of the conclusion should not be the conclusion itself. The way you structure your argument is important. You should present your, art, your, your arguments in these reviews and in your group project, which you'll present to the class ultimately, in a natural order. Now, what's a nice natural order for lots of arguments? Chronologically might be a nice order. Alternatively, if you go to journalism school, they'll teach you about something called the inverted pyramid. And the idea is that you put your biggest point first. Why? It's called the primacy effect. And why do journalists always put their biggest point? They want to get everything that they can in that first paragraph of the article. Yeah, grab the attention. And most readers stop doing what? They stop reading after that first paragraph. So they, they want that big, you know, bang to grab your attention, get your interest, and, and tell you what it's basically about in that first paragraph. Alternatively, you might put your strongest argument last, which is playing on something called the recency effect, which is that that's the thing that most people, that's the takeaway. That's what they'll remember. That's the last thing that they heard. But just find a way of structuring it that makes sense, that has a nice flow to it. Think about the flow and the voice in the argument that you're making. You might try these two different ordering of things to see which, which is better. The use of consistent terms is important in your argument. So you should avoid using various different terms to mean the same thing in your article review. And I find students doing this all the time. They won't stick to consistent terms for an argument. They'll change terms because they want to be creative. I had a student who turned in an article review several years ago and obviously had wanted to take a creative writing course and he wrote, I approached this project eager as a squirrel in an oak forest. When wham, bam, the answer came to me like an elephant in a circus tumbling routine. And the whole paper was replete with inconsistent terms throughout his argument. And I wrote at the bottom, I leapt like a gazelle to the conclusion you deserved an F for forcing me to read this dribble and you need to take a creative writing course to get this out of your system. So, you know, stick to consistent and don't, this is not about necessarily a creative writing project. And you should stick to one meaning for each term. So don't, don't engage in what we call the fallacy, the logically inconsistent fallacy of equivocation, where you use words in more than one sense. And a classic example of this is during the Equal Rights Amendment debate, one of the congressmen stood on the floor of the House and said, men and women are not physically equal and therefore the law shouldn't pretend that they are. Well, that's using equality in two different senses of the word. Equality of strength is not the same thing as equality before the law, is it? I mean, in the strictest sense, men and women are not equal. If you send a male and a female candidate of roughly the same body build off to the gym, which one is going to put on muscle mass faster? It's going to be the male. But is that the same thing as equality before the law? It's, it's not. Equality before the law is what? It's being, tre it's being treated the same in similar situations. If you kill somebody, you should be given the same penalty as somebody else who killed somebody, and not more or less. That's what equality before the law is. So stick to one meaning for each term. Um, a lot of you will use 
articles that will include samples, for example, in, in products. And so uh, last semester I had a number of you, or a number of, a number of groups that did a project on <coughs> drugs and the manufacture and distribution of certain types of drugs and whether or not they were ethical. And they gave a lot of sampling statistics in those articles, a lot of cause and effect sample statistics. And so you have to remember that uh, samples should be representative. When you're looking and reading these articles, if they use statistics, ask yourself, are they, are they taking from a representative sample of people? Um, arguments by authority, a lot of you will, will rely on an authoritative source in the article to make an argument, and those sources should be qualified and cited. Just because somebody has a PhD doesn't make them qualified in all things, right? I have a PhD, my PhD is in what? Marketing. Does that make me qualified to talk about global warming? Probably not, right? It's not, uh, I'm not an expert in that field. So you should, you should look at, to see if the people who are talking or writing these articles are qualified to make the arguments that they make. Um, and finally, conclusions. Your conclusions should flow naturally from your premises. So you argue from premise to premise to premise to conclusion, and you want that to flow in a nice, logically consistent term. Now, I've given you a lot of information here. There, you could take an entire course in logic and critical thinking. But if you have questions about this as you're going through, you need to send me an email, a text, and I'll be happy to, to look at or answer your questions about your article reviews and things like that, because I want you all to, to do well on these. So if you're unsure about something, if you're unsure about sources, let me know, and I'll be happy to work with you on clearing that up and, and writing these reviews. So what I want to do now is I want to collect the critical thinking challenge that deals with the grades from your group leaders. And then having gone over this stuff on critical thinking, I'm going to give you another opportunity until Thursday to revise what it is that maybe you were going to submit on the critical thinking challenge for the article review and the one, the example that I gave you on that. So you might want to rethink that. So if you have the great critical thinking challenge, let me have that. I will grade those and turn those back by Thursday. The others, if you want to work, you have until Thursday. And I'm going to give you some class time here uh, to work on that. All right? Any questions? Okay, so you have some class time here to work with your groups on the article review of your curriculum. If you did not sign the roll sheet, please come sign it and make sure that you have it. Alright. It'll be like whenever you're